Welcome to the World of Horror Podcast with Mom and Mac. This is the podcast where we share our love of international horror. Everyone has their fears, but we are not afraid of subtitles. Before we get into it, fair warning, these discussions will include spoilers and language which may not be suitable for all listeners. Let's move on to our first segment, Mom and Mac Chat. Hi, Mac. How's it going? Hi, Mom. Um, It is going well. It is April 1st, which is my cat Luffy's birthday. He's one year old now. I mean, I don't know if that's the day he was born, but that's what the rescue said. I realized at first I was like, oh, that makes sense. He's he's my little April fool. But then when the other rescue said Hoshi's birthday was the 31st of July, I was like, oh, they're just making this shit up. Like, yeah. It, I, I, like April Fool's felt like such a specific day that I was like, oh, that must be the day he was born. And then I realized like they found him when he was alive already. Like they don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyways, <laughs> it's the, it is his birthday though. It's his birthday. It is. For sure it is. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely, I mean, the man's a year old. <laughs> He's so cute. You see, just basking in his glory. He's snoring. He he kind of makes like noises when he breathes. Like you can always tell when he's really interested in something because you just hear like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I asked the vet and they were like, well, he seems like he's fine. Sometimes I'm like, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. No, Do you ever I feel like that? Yeah. I def- like last time we were talking about doctors and how they don't know shit. Um, yeah. I think maybe no one knows yeah. what they're talking about. I, I agree because there are times – this is, must be just foolishness on my part, but I guess growing up, I just assumed that if it's your pro- if, if it's your profession and it deals with helping people, you know what you're doing. Mm. But And so I'll always have these very specific questions and all the time people are just like, I don't know. Well, why am I here <laughs> if you don't know? Um why? What are we doing right now? <laughs> I mean, it's really troubling when it's somebody like in a mental health field or something like that. Like, oh, don't get me started. <laughs> you know how? How? Well, I don't know if I told you the deets, but anyway, I was on this medication one time for sleep, and after a little while, I just had this fully formed thought one day that if I if I just stop taking it and just keep getting the prescriptions filled, I could kill myself easily <laughs> and i was just like it was like a stranger Whoa. was in my head i was like where did that come from yeah and so i gave the pills to um <laughs> to um somebody else who has a dog who uses them you know oh is that like gabapentin it's uh it was trazodone oh but um anyway dogs can take it and um so i went back to my shrink and i told her she goes that that doesn't really happen with that medicine and i said well dr google says it does and it did with my fucking brain so that's just disturbing when that kind of thing happens how do they not know like and how how do they not know i know it's like in my chart su- suicidal ideation like it's I mean, like fucking in there you'd think <sighs> if you even had just like a history of depression they would be like hmm, maybe let's like think about this for a second that that reminds me, well, I probably have already said told the story, but just when I went to my last endo, who was a man, sorry men, but all the male doctors I've had, male doctors, psychiatrists, and therapists have all been fucking horrible. I've had really bad women one, female ones too, but like I've also had good female ones, never had a good male one. So I'm just saying. Um but he just, without even asking any of my history or anything, just gave me like Ativan when I said that I get anxious when I get my blood drawn. And not that Ativan's super dangerous, but I just was like, why wouldn't you ask first? Like, you're just handing the shit out. And when I told my psychiatrist about it, she's like, well, thanks for telling me. But like, you know, that, that'll go through me from now on. I was like, okay, okay, understood. Um, and I've just had a lot of times like that where I'm just like, what are we doing here? What? There's no like rules or like SOPs in place? I don't know. I guess I, not. I Maybe not. I mean, you and I are experts in our field. Uh, this is true. We're like geniuses. You should take our word um, as being like objective truth. And if you have a problem with it, 
reevaluate yourself before you come to us. <laughs> and that goes like way beyond like our careers, just like <laughs> it's just in everything. anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're the no, best. I, I mean, I do feel like I do know what I'm doing in terms of teaching, but I mean, beyond that, I have like a little bit of expertise built up now after doing the podcast with you on international horror films, but that might be it. <laughs> it's like n- none of that has to do with like another human being's like like health. You know, you don't know. You don't know. I mean, now that we're reaching more (laughs) wohos in Asia, oh, I we had a download for somewhere in Africa the other day, and I was just like, we are almost on every continent. That's awesome. Wait, who were Antarctica? At least least once. Yeah. No, I don't, and I'm not. I'm not too worried about Antarctica. But um, <laughs> there's got to be somebody there who's listening to podcasts. They, yeah, I I hope so. You would think. I mean, I would think that kind huh. of work that people do there. Just get they bored. Would want, they would want a podcast. Yeah. How are you? Oh, I'm pretty good. Good. Do you like the spring air? <laughs> Fuck yeah. Fuck yes. <laughs> I love it. I'm like. This is this is the best it's gonna get. Like it was <laughs> eighty one. Well, it was like I mean, and it wasn't part of it wasn't great, but I mean, it was like eighty one today for a high, which is a little high, but and the pollen is like, oh, I'm dying off the charts. Yeah, but the sun is out. It's gorgeous. It seems like everyone's in a good mood. You yeah, know, I'm going for more walks. Um, the end is in sight in terms of the semester. It's like, <laughs> I think um, May 9th is my absolute last day. That's like the that's graduation. Coming up. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, I mean, that's and, next month. And then I don't do anything for like three weeks. I don't have to teach again until like May 30th. But um, I wish I could show you my calendar. I made a calendar for my ethics kids and it's basically like work day debate you know presentations <laughs> like i'm lecturing on euthanasia like once yeah. and i'm going to help them review for a for a test but other than that they're doing it all nice. and i'm going to try to do the same thing for my critical thinking class and um i should have been doing this all along man what have i, I been doing students learn better that way anyway i mean like i know there's some things you obviously have to lecture on but like the things that I remember the most are not the things I just was like sitting, you know, right. yeah, and absorbing. And then this summer, I think I'm just going to really try to have a real good think about things. I don't know if I told you, I got hired by another one of those corporate outfits. I think you did. Yeah. And yeah. they pay really, really well. Nice. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I've been, um, I'm like cleared to teach two classes. So, I mean, I'm like, give both to me, baby. Um, yeah. So I put um, the, the date 2027 popped into my head. I would like to not be working um, mm-hmm. at the college by 2027. Yeah. So. It's, a, it's good to have like a, a date, you know, concrete yeah. date. It just like popped into my head. It's not really based in any kind of reality, but you know, I just feel like if I can make a living teaching online um, and nice. make like good money, <laughs> I'm yeah. going to do that. And then I'm going to do art the rest of the time. That sounds mm-hmm. really lovely. Yeah. So, and I watched both these movies today and um, yeah, I can't wait to hear your thoughts on, on one of them, especially. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote like so many pages of notes because nice. it's not even plot summary. It was just me being like. <laughs> <laughs> they're both pretty buck wild. I mean. Yeah. Honestly, they're, they could even just be a genre of like craziest movie you've ever seen. You know? <laughs> I certainly think our first one is maybe up there in craziest movies I've ever seen. 
Okay. Well, I just have to say, if you think that's crazy, you should watch the sequel. (laughs) (laughs) Because the sequel is basically a musical. What? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. It is amazing. But um, anyway, React, do you want to get into it? Let's get into it. Okay. The Slumber Party Massacre, the synopsis from INDB states, a female high school student slumber party turns into a bloodbath as a newly escaped psychotic serial killer wielding a power drill prowls her neighborhood. Directed by Amy Holden Jones, written by Rita Mae Brown, starring Michelle Michaels, Robert Steele, and Michael Valela. Cinematography by Stephen L. Posey. Edited by Wendy Green Brickmont and Sean Foley. Music by Ralph Jones. The release dates are September 10th, 1982 in Los Angeles and November 12th, 1982 in New York City. It has a runtime of 76 minutes. How would you feel about this runtime, Mac? Um, <clears throat> I got to say, for such a short runtime, I oh, really no. felt like I felt every minute. <laughs> oh, no. Maybe I just if not wasn't in the right headspace. Maybe I need to watch again. But I was like. 20 minutes left? Oh, <laughs> oh, you do need to watch this again. Maybe it's like watching it by myself at my desk. I couldn't, you know, feel the full power of it. I think I think watching this at a slumber party would have been awesome. Oh, yes, indeed. You know? I like, also think if you watch, I mean, the fourth time I've seen, you know, I saw it was better than the first time I saw it. Um, I, I feel like that would be the case. Like, yeah. um, you know, when I was watching this, I thought, Okay, it, um, it's a weird limbo feeling I have, which is I don't want to have a slumber party with anyone. I want to sleep in my my bed. Um, and anytime it's been offered to me in the past few years, like, do you want to stay over? I'm like, I, I, no, I'll do whatever I can to get home tonight. But I do miss them. Yeah, like I, it's. I feel like it's a bygone era for me now. Like I don't want to do it. But I look back fondly on the memories of sleepovers. I'm with you. I I really do miss that time in my life. I mean, even if, you know, sometimes I had a bad time, I just like it that, you know, on Friday we were going to get get together at somebody's house and we're going to eat a bunch of junk food and we're going to watch movies and talk about boys and just do all those things. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I think here's my theory, actually. I feel like that's just adulthood now. So that's why I don't need to do it. Like it was a little slice of adulthood. Cause when you're a kid, you're just like, I want to fucking get out of this goddamn house and stay mm. with my friends, you know? And I don't want to think about school or anything. And I get to eat whatever I want. But I do that now. Like <laughs> I, I eat chips now. I don't have to hang out with a friend to do that. So I, maybe that's why it's a bygone era. Cause it's the freedom of adulthood. Kind of, um, not that you're going anywhere, but it's you know it's and it's community hanging out with your girlfriends. I got, I don't know what it was like for I know sis sis boys growing up they definitely have sleepovers, but I don't think this is sexist of me to say I do feel like it's different for girls. Like I feel like young girl friendships are very special. I I wish young boys got that same felt that same freedom that that was encouraged for them because it's like we were talking about anything under the sun like yes you know revealing our deepest secrets to each other and when i ask a lot of my male friends if they had that experience they're like no <laughs> no i did not and I- i'm sure some boys did but it doesn't seem as universal as yeah girls i mean i just yeah it's like sort of this protected this protected space it sounds really like hippy dippy or something but it's just this kind of almost sacred space yeah. to be with, you know, your girlfriends and yeah, the parents aren't around and the boys aren't around, the teachers aren't around and it's just the girls. And then you yeah. can just sort of like compare notes and giggle and swear and I don't know, just do all the things that you don't do the rest of the time. Yeah. 
Okay, so here's the plot. Um, a paper boy delivers a paper with a headline announcing that mass murderer Russ Thorne has escaped. Trish wakes up and decides that since she has some pretty nice boobs now, she is going to throw away her childhood toys, except for a creepy clown doll. <laughs> Why did she keep that one? It's a good question. I kept swiping at my screen because I thought it was dirty because the camera was so like, I don't know. And like, I, I kind of love it. Also, the mic so many times in different <laughs> scenes is just getting blown out by like the actors. But it's very charming. Yeah. And then the boom mic shows up in anatomy. Oh, I wrote question. down every time I saw it. because <laughs> awesome. I was losing my mind. I have never seen that in a movie before. <laughs> uh, um, the news about Russ Thorne comes on the radio, but Trish has to send her parents off on their trip. Neighbor says he will make sure the girls do not get, get in any trouble. He's my favorite character. He's no. definitely gay. And um, I love his shirt. He's a creep. He's a creep? Yeah. You think yeah, so? Yeah. Why is he always like hanging out in the shadows and shit and like sneaking into Trisha's house and like. That was a little bit weird, but I don't know. I liked him. Oh. <laughs> I thought he was like. I... The, I mean, I knew he wasn't gay canonically, but I, in my head, I was like, I could see, you know, if, if like. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't think he was a creep. I, maybe oh, I'm projecting. Wow. I thought he was like a cute older guy. Mm. He has like a cute floor. I would wear that shirt. I didn't. I. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, different, different take. <laughs> After Trish puts her toys in the garbage, a man's arm is seen taking the Barbie out of the bag. Two high school boys head on a telephone repair woman who is yoinked into her van by the killer. She bangs on the back windows for help, but is drilled to death. How did they not hear her? How did they not hear that? I don't know. That was the scariest thing I've ever seen. She just gets, like, yoinked is the best word for it. Because it is kind of comedic, this hand just coming out of nowhere and just pulling her. And she's like, ah! And then, you know, it shuts. Also, one of the most, unre like, she looks like Rosie the Riveter, and her mm -hmm. reaction to these young boys hitting on her is just like, oh, maybe, I don't know, you know? <laughs> like, nobody talks like this. I know, but I do love, I really do love this movie, and I, I like it that she doesn't, if, if a guy had written the movie, then she would have flirted back with them. Yeah, know? she just kind of, like, is ambivalent, you yeah. know? And sometimes you got to be that way. Yeah. And you have slobbering teenagers all around you. Not that any, I mean, like, the the students are, like, indistinguishable from the teachers. Yeah. <laughs> like, especially Carrie. that female teacher that they focus on. I'm like, she could be one of them. <laughs> Carrie a la Carrie. Like, yeah. For sure. Um, in gym class, the girls play basketball as the boys cheer on Valerie, the new girl, who the boys think is a vi is very good looking and the girls think is a teacher's pet. <laughs> then we have the shower scene. There oh is my. nudity, but most of it is on butts, not boobs. Um, I would disagree. What? There's so much on boobs. There's there, like there are shots of boobs, but like the lingering shots are on butts. Okay, there was one shot at one point where the boobs took up the entire screen. It was like a jump scare of boob. <laughs> I feel like it just lingers on their whole body. But you're right. There is a shot of one girl in particular when she turns around, the camera just lowers and it's just like, that's an ass. Yep. <laughs> and I just thought, I mean, I hope that the set was comfortable, but like, I was just like, how weird it would be to just sh bathe yourself like in front of cameras like that. Yeah, so I a couple of things. First of all, this script was written first as a satire, but then when um, Roger Corman got a hold of it, he insisted on <laughs> nudity. 
And so the director put all this nudity into the movie, but she was kind of like, okay, you want nudity? I'll give you nudity, but I'm going to make it as unsexy as possible. I mean, these girls are washing their bodies, but they're not like sensuously washing their bodies. They're just sort of taking care of business. They're having conversation while they're doing it. And um, I also heard that a lot of the girls didn't want to show their boobs and so they're more comfortable with their butts being shot or, you know, that kind of thing. There's a scene later where a boy is feeling up a breast and that's not the woman, the actor woman's mm. breast. It's somebody else's because <laughs> she really didn't want that um, in there. And then her parents thought it was her anyway. And I guess it was embarrassing. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, I, I, so I, I do think you're right in that they – you know, it's not filmed in a way of like, you know, there's some movies you watch and the girls are like bouncing up and down or they look just like so over the top. Like these girls and I mean, women are the, the actresses. They, they're they adult women like they they are just talking to each other and whatnot. But I, it is still very like it is eye candy. I mean, like if you're oh, if yeah. you are attracted to women, you will just. You can just very intently watch all these beautiful women who are naked. <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, Trish makes eyes at Valerie and compliments her on her basketball playing. In the locker room, someone complains that Valerie drinks too much milk and is too pretty. <laughs> the dialogue's a little crazy here. They're like, yeah, she works at it. Like, she wears makeup. Like, what? Yeah, they all do. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> but I love that she drinks too much milk. <laughs> I mean, I guess that they they picked the girl who gave those lines. She is the shortest, I feel like. So, she's definitely <laughs> jealous. Definitely. Trish invites the new girl Valerie to the party, but she declines the offer. After school, the group discusses the party as Russ watches them from the van side mirror. And we see the body of the repair woman in the dumpster. That shot is so good because, like, it's kind of like a bird's eye, so the kids don't see it, but we do. Yeah, pretty sad. Yeah, Linda. Sorry, I have a comma for some reason. I must have deleted something. Linda <laughs> goes back into the school to retrieve a book, but gets locked inside. Like some of the doors are locked, so she cannot exit the building. I was like, where's what? the janitors? It's like also, four. There's like three. It's not even four. It's like 340. You know? <laughs> I know. Also, that place got locked down. Like, yeah. In That's like what I'm a saying. minute flat. But also, you, even if they locked the doors, you would still be able to get out. Yeah, they don't lock them to the prevent outside. people inside from leaving. <laughs> She's she might, maybe she's stupid. She might be stupid. We don't really know her. We don't get to know her very well. She's attacked by Russ, armed with a power drill. He slashes her arm, but she runs away and hides in a closet. Russ searches for her and only discovers her when he sees her blood spill out from under the door where she is hiding. Okay, and this is one of my favorite scenes because I don't know where she got this towel, but she has a towel and she's desperately <laughs> trying to wipe up the blood. And I don't know why, but I just thought that was so funny. Like, it's such a, like... Like, it, it's it's so useless, you know? <laughs> yeah. Also, that was funny. Like, once again, we didn't plan this all that well. And there's but, kind of a similar scene. Yeah. In the second movie. Um, he drills into the door. She screams. And then we see Ru Russ running back to the van. So, R.I.P. Linda. That the the shot of the drill poking out, that was when it first clicked to me of like, oh, that's supposed to be very phallic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was the first, I was like, oh, oh okay, I get it. <laughs> Mark drops Trish off and we see that Valerie lives next door and she has a cat. Someone is stalking one of the girls, but when the man puts his hand on her shoulder, she flips him on on his back. It's her boyfriend. There's like four fake outs in a row. Yeah. So I think this is the first fake out. When Coach Jana comes home, there is a news story about Russ Thorne on the radio, but she switches it off. Someone is drilling through her door, but it's just the handy lady who's putting in her peephole. I love all the, the like, 
female like workers in this movie. Me too. <laughs> yeah. And apparently she really was the one who's drilling the hole. She really was like a worker on the a, a crew member That's cool. on the film. I thought it was disappointing because I thought she was the teacher's girlfriend. Me too. In another movie, maybe. Well, I think she was supposed to be a lesbian. The the she, she gave me vibes. You know? yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think anybody who has like, like later Jana Holt ha- has like a fire poker. But mm. she, yeah. So um, Trish notices the front door is open, but she doesn't think anything of it. She just sits down to play the piano. We see a shadowy figure and hear footsteps. Trish runs to the door. But it's just the neighbor guy. I I was like, you know, they asked him to check in. Don't come into the... You, you can't call out, hey, Trish, are you home? It's your neighbor. <laughs> Coach Jana hears some rustling. But it's just Muffin the cat who's been in the closet all day. Oh, poor kitty. She And I love how her reaction, she wasn't like... I feel like in movies, people are always angry at cats. But I was pleasantly surprised that she was so apologetic she was like no come back i'm so sorry that's how a real cat owner would react i was doing something with my critical thinking class where we were looking at like classic tropes and there's a super cut probably more than one online of like the cat jump scare Mm. so i think this was uh, definitely in there the guys are planning a way to scare the girls you know how they love to scream they walk by the telephone van As the party begins that night, the girls smoke marijuana and drink alcohol while Valerie babysits her younger sister, Courtney, across the street. Okay, now, just a second. In some of the write-ups, they're across the street. And there is one shot where it looks like Valerie watches Courtney cross the street and go to Trish's house. But in the very beginning, when Trish, Trish is dropped off, the camera pans to the left and we see that that's Valerie's house. So which is it? Movie? Yeah. I, I thought they were side by side. That's what I thought they were yeah. side by side too. Anyway. There's a clattering from the garbage cans. Valerie, it, they've got to be because when that guy crawls mm-hmm. from Valerie's house to Trisha's house, There's no way he crawled all the way across the street. And she even says she heard something. I really feel like it'd be hard to hear somebody screaming in a house across the street from you. Mm Mm-hmm. Also, can we talk about how how delightfully weird the younger sister is? Yes. I feel like this is one of the most accurate little sisters I've ever seen. Like, Really? How so? I mean this in the way of like, I feel like too often movies written by men or women written by men or girls written by men are very like perfect. They're super cute and adorable and you want to protect them. And they're just, you know, the cutest little thing. And they are, but I feel like young girls are weird. Like they're just as weird as little boys are. And um, for instance, the the one kid I have in my life is uh, – Our friend that we watch Survivor with, his youngest daughter, she is so weird. And I mean that in the best way. Like out of nowhere, she'll just say like off the wall shit. And it makes me so happy. Like, (laughs) I I don't know. I just feel like and that this young sister is so weird. (laughs) Like she's such a weirdo. It is refreshing. You're right. Yeah. We don't often. Boys are allowed to be weird. Um, Yeah. I mean, unless they have a clinical diagnosis, you really don't see that many weird girls. Yeah. And they usually, and like in real life, girls are usually weird. Yeah. In my experience, as I a former, kids, as a former are, weird girl. <laughs> I think kids are weird. Mm-hmm. I mean, kids used to scare the shit out of me. They just, I mean, I used to say weird stuff, didn't I? Oh, you said the weirdest <laughs> stuff. Your dad would be like, uh, Talk about your like grim fairy tales, very grim fairy tales, because you would just come up with this like weird shit like, from the back seat of the car. We'd be like, "What? What was that?" And meanwhile, the sweetest little face. Oh, couldn't be sweeter. 
All right, there's a clattering from the garbage cans. Valerie goes to check on it, and when she does, Courtney finds a Playgirl magazine with Sylvester Stallone on the cover in Valerie's bedroom. Two boys from school, Jeff and Neil, arrive and spy on the girls while they change clothes. Like you do, right? I mean, everybody just, like, changes in front of each. Even when I was a girl, I mean, we would take turns going in the bathroom. We didn't, like, change in front of each other. Right? Like, and if you (laughs) did, you'd all be facing away. At least, okay, I will say I do have one friend. I won't name her um, because we're still friends. And I love this friend. But she has never had an issue being naked in front of me and Mm. used to answer the door in, like, a thong. And I would be like, like, I'm just not used to that, so I would be embarrassed. He'd be like, oh, come on in. I'm just, you know, putting my clothes on. And I'd be like, well, where do I look? I don't, I don't know. Um, so maybe some people do. There's always that one friend, but not all of them. I feel yeah. like I feel like it would have been more realistic. But again, I think this was the director being like, okay. Yeah. You know? And the boys um, got there at the perfect time. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um. Trish orders a pizza while Diane goes into the garage to get firewood. A man lurks in the shadows with a cleaver. It is Mr. Content, the neighbor. He kills a snail in the firewood. That's number 53. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) But then Russ kills Mr. Content outside with his power drill. Jackie reads a headline in the paper. Boy 10 sucked down sewer but survives. Did you... (laughs) Did you hear that? Yeah. Ah! I didn't hear that till like the third time. Trish thinks she sees someone outside. Her Barbie doll is covered in blood and stuck to the outside window. Ah! Jump scare. <laughs> Scary. They figure it's just the boys playing a trick. Trish and Diane check on the garage door, and we see that Russ has gotten inside. Valerie looks out the window. A la House of the Devil! Did you see that shot? No, I don't remember. <gasps> You've got to go back. It's brilliant. It's shot. It that's got to be, got to be where that came from. It's just like a square shot. She opens the curtains. She's right smack in the middle of the frame. Mm. Beautiful. The lights go out in the house. They go to check on the fuse in the garage while Diane talks on the phone with her boyfriend. All four girls. Then I mean, then she joins them, and all four girls go into the garage, which I really liked. Yeah. You know, none of this, like, there've been a little, there's been a little bit up to this point of like one onesies, one person at a time going off. But I liked it that they all four are going into the garage. That seems a lot more real to me. And I love, I don't know, just their energy is so cute. Like, at one point, you know, um, Trish is just like, oh, the fuse box, it's in the garage. And they all just look at each other and they're like, eek! <laughs> I just yeah. thought that was so cute. <laughs> um, none of the fuses are blown, but some are missing. Jeff and Neil startle the girls, but but then one of the girls knocks Jeff down. Valerie hears clattering outside again and goes to check on the garbage cans again. And then Courtney attacks Valerie outside. That imp. She is an imp. Diane meets her boyfriend outside. This guy is real funny looking, don't you think? <laughs> I think all the men in this film are funny looking. They kind of honestly. are. The girls are such they're so hot creatures. Yeah, yeah. These guys are just none of not, them deserve any of them. <laughs> not lo- not looks wise, or even Valerie. attitude wise. Honestly, like none well, of them are yeah, gentlemen. They're, they're per they're perverted. I, they do kind of redeem themselves a little bit. I think. Yeah. Valerie plays with Courtney's hair, and Courtney wonders if she'll ever be beautiful. Cut to Diane and boyfriend making out in the car. Neil and Jeff are now in the house and are perving on the girls right in front of them. <laughs> Diane's BF wants her to come to his place so they can go fuck, and Diane goes to ask Trish if it's okay if she goes over to his house. Valerie is looking for something to put on Jeff's black eye and not finding a stake. She chooses two hot dogs. (laughs) I thought that was really cute. Diane goes to her boyfriend's car to find him decapitated. Ah! And then she is murdered. I was sad about that one. Me too. 
It's re- apparently it's re- uh, for both of these films. They they've made the statement that it's very easy and fast to decapitate someone. I feel like it cannot be that easy. <laughs> Especially in the second one, it happens in seconds. Like, like you don't even see it happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> While on the phone with their coach, Rachel Jana, the girls answer the door and find the pizza delivery man with his eyes drilled out. Trish calls 911, but Russ cuts the telephone line. Coach Jana calls Valerie and asks her if she'll go check on Trish. But Valerie doesn't want to. Man, I wouldn't want to either. The teens arm themselves with knives as Jeff and Neil run for help. But Jeff is killed in the garage, and Neil is attacked outside Valerie's door. She doesn't hear him because she's watching a horror film. I do like that. Like the the juxtaposition of like the screams in the movie. The girls are sitting together, but Jackie says she's hungry. So she eats a slice of pizza. <laughs> Maybe one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> she says something like, you know, I, I'll feel better if I eat. And I don't know. The other girls are just like, oh, my God. And she like she puts the box on the dead man. Yes. She's like, well, might as well. <laughs> Neil has crawled back to Trisha's and is crying. He's attacked by Russ outside the door and his blood spills inside. Very sad. Very sad. And the girls... Like, some of them want to open the door. Maybe it's Neil. And then other ones don't want to open it. And then Neil gets killed. Valerie knocks on the front door. Jackie goes to open the door. But when she does, Russ kills her. Trish and Kim barricade themselves in Trish's bedroom. But Russ enters through a window and kills Kim as Trish flees. And at this point, I'm like, Trish, you're kind of a bad bad person. person. Yeah. (laughs) She's already also, like, right before this, she suggested that maybe Valerie and the killer are in cahoots. Yeah. Like, what? Why? Where did, where did that come from? <laughs> great shots of, of the, great shots of hose hanging in the shower. Russ, like, pulls back the curtain and there's just, like, underwear and hose, like, hanging in the shower. I love that. And then also Trish is hiding in a garment bag. I love that. That was very cool. Valerie and Courtney enter the house and find Kim dead in the fridge. There's a great. Oh my God. That sequence is so funny because like they, (laughs) Valerie's like, or no, Kim is the little sister, right? She, Courtney, Courtney. Um, and Kim's in the fridge. Courtney like is like, I'm going to grab a beer. And Valerie's like, no, you know, you're, you, you can't, you're too young. And so it's like, they don't see her, but like Kim's almost flopping out every time. And that happens twice. And then finally, Courtney's like, I'm just going to go ahead and grab it. And then she sees her. <laughs> that was like, that, that should be in the MoMA. <laughs> that was really, really good. Okay. Then they go and they hide from Russ. So Courtney goes under the, um, under the couch and Valerie goes into the basement. Okay, so Courtney's under the couch and she sees Russ drag the pizza boy's body out of the living room and down the, down the stairs into the basement. And then Russ lies down in the living room on his back under a blanket. Oh, you know, that's very, um, that reminds me of the first Saw movie because that's the big reveal is that the guy, the, the dead guy in the laying in the middle of the room has been Saw, uh... the Saw man. I forget his name the whole time. I'm just going to pretend like all of these movies took it from this movie. (laughs) I think so. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would lay money on House of the Devil. Yeah. I mean, if it was that similar. I'm going to try to find them and put them side by side and you'll see. I believe you. (laughs) It's very important. (laughs) All right. Coach Jana, having grown concerned over the phone call earlier, arrives and is confronted by Russ. Courtney trips Russ and Trish stabs him, but Russ disembowels Jana with the drill. But Jana is so good. Like she pushes her out of the way. I Something about this movie is like, despite the fact that there are a lot of young women dying at the hands of a craven man, I feel like usually that would disturb me more but i feel like this movie is just silly enough to where it doesn't upset me because usually i'm like i don't want to watch women be killed like 
I, and I don't mean that in like a sexist way. It's just so many like movies also include like a very like the lack of a better word, rapey vibe of it all. Mm -hmm. And it just, it reminds me too much of like real life and it just bums me out, you know, but I never felt that watching this movie. Like it, it just feels, I don't know, fun in a way that other yeah, movies kind of involving fun. women don't. Right. Well, I think he's so unlikely as a killer. You know, he's short. He's kind of got a rat face. He's know? got a great fit. Denim on denim. <laughs> <laughs> but and he's got this huge drill and it's like, okay. Yeah. Um, but he's not he's not scary all by himself. He's only scary because he's got this drill. Yeah. You know, he's um, just in the right like he's good at scaring people, but he's not unbeatable. No, and if you saw him on the street, you wouldn't be scared. You'd be, you know, you wouldn't think anything about him. Um and then the women to me, like I don't know how tall the actress is who plays Valerie, but she seems very tall. Yeah, they all and seem very tall. She's very like when she just moves herself with like a lot of grace and strength and I don't know. Russ tells Trish that she's pretty and that he loves her. He says it takes a lot of love for a person to do this. And you know you want it. You love it. <laughs> she's just like, what? Huh? I've never seen you in my life. <laughs> I don't know you. I didn't hurt you. Like, what are you doing here? Valerie chases Russ with a machete, cutting off the tip of his drill bit and then severing his hand before slicing his stomach open. And to me, that stomach slice... That to me, the only first thing I thought of was like slaying a dragon. Mm. I don't know why. Just like, you know what I mean? Like, but anyway, she's immobilized him. He falls into the pool and sinks beneath the water only to emerge moments later and attack them once more. But Valerie finally kills him with the machete as she is like holding it up in front of her oh, body yeah. and he dives onto the machete. Yeah, they all have very phallic. She's got yes. and her machete is huge. That was my yes. thought too. Is like she that's the biggest fucking. I was like, where did she get this? Is the biggest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. I know because like everything else in the basement, she's like a little tack hammer. No, you know, and she's like <laughs> grabbing all these tools. <laughs> and it's so she's like, like a needle nose plier. Nah. I don't think so. <laughs> it's so great that she cuts his drill off too. Like yes. I don't know that part is just and it great. Just makes a funny like noise. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> and and also they they both kind of look at each other like they pause like what just happened <laughs> and i love that in that moment she's like oh fuck it <laughs> like gets his hands too valerie and trish break down in tears as courtney looks on in shock sirens are heard in the distance i think valerie and trish should date they have been giving each other mm -hmm. energy the whole movie like i love the way you play basketball okay uh -huh. okay gay <laughs> and now they're trauma bonded <laughs> what could be better for this scene here's some trivia for the scene where Kim's dead body was in the fridge Deborah DeLiso had to be stuffed in the fridge and was clinging with her right hand where the light bulb used to be holding her breath and playing dead for a full five seconds twice before slowly flopping out Flop, slowly flopping out she recalled that scene as tricky but was thankful of her past gymnastic training for that particular moment in the film. She did a great job. She did. Great physicality. Not unlike Anna Lou's physicality in Anatomy, but we'll get there. <laughs> Amy Holden Jones is not very sympathetic to people who complain that she's a sellout to her gender as a woman who produced an exploitation flick with a lot of naked girls in it. That's what Rod, Roger Corman, the producer, wanted, and that's how it's done. You give the studio what they want. Nobody complains that Scorsese, Jonathan Demme, and Ron Howard made exploitation pictures, but when a woman tries, she gets called a hypocrite in a turncoat. That's BS. It should be noted that Holden Jones has parlayed this into a successful film career, producing such hits as Mystic Pizza and The Getaway. I am with her. I agree. And... I do feel like women and like 
any sort of minority group is held to such a higher standard under such a bigger microscope than white men. Like, a white man could do something, and everybody's like, well, yeah, of course, but then you do the same thing, and it's like, oh, how anti-feminist of you. Like, what about that guy? (laughs) And also, you know, I, I don't know, I feel it's clearly silly. Like it's if you just take this at mm-hmm. as at face value of like, well, they just want to put a bunch of naked girls in this movie. It's like I don't I feel like she did it in a way that feels really silly. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's clear it to me it's clear that they weren't trying to like make some big statement or anything. It's just a very is, fun, silly movie. This is way before Scream. This is eighty two. Scream came out in ninety six. Wow. So I mean it took you know, people were not like playing with this genre mm-hmm. at the time, except she she did. Yeah. You know, so I just think that's amazing. The overhead shots in the gym before Linda's attack were achieved by having a cameraman on top of a cherry picker because the film had a low budget and the crew couldn't afford a camera crane. That's incredible. On the day of her death scene, Brinke Stevens' left arm was covered in sticky, sweet, blood-red caro syrup resembling blood. When they broke for lunch, she said <laughs> every flying insect on the block hunted her down and stuck to her arm. <laughs> That's hilarious. What does Letterboxd have to say about it? Nups gave it a half star. Half star for the boobs. Shanty Bay gave it a half star. Warning, no bra was worn in the making of this film. The Slumber Party Massacre is riddled with a ridiculous amount of annoying fake-out scares. 80% of the kills happen off-screen. The cinematography is abysmal. The acting is horrid. And the killer is unmemorable. What? I will not be watching any sequels. This served better as a demented porn film than a watchable slasher. On the real, I would rather women not have to wear bras. They're Mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And nobody would wear a bra at a sleepover. Yeah. Stupid. (laughs) Gary Mason gave it one star. Just highlights how poor the battery quality is on modern power tools because he gets some work done with that big boy. (laughs) No, they just cut out all the shots of him charging. (laughs) (laughs) I hate movies a lot. Gave it five stars. I super love this movie. And I so totally need Kim's space baby t-shirt. Lol. <laughs> what are all those emojis? There's the heart hearts all on the face emoji. What do you, which, what do you call that one? It's like, it's like in love. Yeah. He's like lovey, lovey, dovey, love, lovey, dovey emoji, basketball emoji, um, planet emoji, pizza emoji. Slav Goblin gave it five stars. Finally, a horror film about, Real life horror. No masked identity. No backstory. Literally just some guy who starts killing for no reason. The pizza guy scene kills me every time. Kim in the fridge is so unserious but iconic. Just overall brilliant. I agree, Slab Goblin. (laughs) And Telcott gave it five stars. Jackie is the true hero of the movie for not letting the pizza go to waste. Missed opportunity never to have the killer say... This does not augur well for you. (laughs) (laughs) All right. How would we rate it? Hmm. Well, drills. Obviously. I'll give it three and a slashed drill, but with the caveat that this is just for my first watch. And I think under better conditions, I could see this rating going up. Mm -hmm. But I, I would not recommend sitting alone at your desk watching this. I think I ha- I have given it three and a half stars on Letterbox, but I I think it's a four star film. For drill, you mean? For dr- uh sorry. <laughs> for drills. Would we watch it again? Yes. Yes. Favorite scene or kill? <laughs> Kim Kim in the fridge is I, That's I mean pretty great. That that was amazing. I couldn't That's believe they did it twice and then went back in for a third time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really nice. Um I think the pizza guy, the yeah. first time you see it, it's just like, whoa. Yeah. Because that totally happens off screen. And he has, his eyes are drilled out. So uh, it's pretty nasty. 
Who wins the You Fool Award? Uh, there's a lot of fools in this movie, I got to say. Mm-hmm. Um, I think most of them are fools, to be fair. <laughs> I think Valerie's the least foolish of them all. Um, and it's just degrees of being a fool as you get away from her. Um, <laughs> I guess maybe that girl who's trying to clean up her blood with the Aww, towel. That that thing. <laughs> I mean, A for A for effort. <laughs> I mean, you know, she's going into shock. She's like the most afraid she's ever been in her life. You know, I think it makes a whole lot of sense. Oh, it does. But I was also like, run, bitch, run. Like, I don't care why she's like, yeah. But all right. Well, that was the Slumber Party Massacre. We did it. Did we do it in under an hour? We did. Holy shit. I mean, it's a pretty, I mean, it's a fast movie. Our next film is called Anatomy, and it is also Anatomy in German, but you should know that in German, it's spelled A-N-A-T-O-M-I-E. Different. (laughs) Here's a brief plot summary from IMDb. A cute med student starts a summer course at Heidelberg University. David's on her dissection table. She met him the day before on the train. Something's wrong. (laughs) Um, <laughs> quick, <laughs> quick preface here. Um, <laughs> I, this movie was entertaining, but I think I hate it. Okay. And I actually think this pairs amazingly with the first movie. It really does. Cause this one, I can't, um, like, I can't believe that there was a single woman on the planning of this movie. You can't tell me that there was a woman who touched the script of this film and it shows <laughs> it like, it feels like a guy's attempt at writing about and trying desperately to maybe say something, but just ends up saying like nothing. I don't know. It it says a lot. I don't, I man, this was weird. It was directed by directed and written by Steven Ruzowitzki. It stars Franca Patente, Benno Furman, Anna Luce, Holger Speckhan, Sebastian Blomberg, and Tragut Buer. Cinematography by Peter Von Holler, edited by Ueli Kristen, and music by Marius Roland. It was released September 8th. 2000 in the u.s with a runtime of 103 minutes this movie feels so steeped in the 2000s oh yeah and i feel like there was this like and not that movies don't have misogynistic themes now but or i say the misogynistic as in they're not trying to say anything about it they just are but there was just a very special vibe of the 2000s that i feel like was demented and horrible and this movie brought me right back (laughs) oh yeah i yeah there's some stuff that's just like yep this is just the world we live in yeah yay (laughs) um over the opening credits the camera glides over a body a hand traces and caresses it until we see the hand cut open the abdomen the professor tells the student he must use gloves because I guess there's a guy with his just hands touching some parts. Man, this movie made me afraid of doctors. I was like, they all oh. seem stupid. <laughs> I know they have to learn from somewhere, but it's like, Jesus, you had to get into this school, didn't you? <laughs> Paula is introduced, finding an anomaly in her cadaver. Paula is like, you know, she. I think she's very beautiful. She has a kind of handsome face. Like she has a really strong jaw, really short hair. She is very cute, but they're obviously trying to make her like, well, there's a contrast with a girl in the future. That's like, oh, she's hot. You know, Paula's cute, but this girl's hot. And we just open with some great 2000s transphobia with Paula saying she found an anomaly in the cadaver, a female cadaver. And the teacher goes, oh, an anomaly. What? Did you find a penis? Ha ha. And he just starts like nagging her, like just belit. Like, I guess it just don't even open up your mouth if you're a woman. Cause even though she's not doing anything wrong, 
he just, I don't know, is an asshole. She holds it fascinated and then accidentally drops it on the floor to the delight of her classmates. Her <laughs> professor is really hands-on, if you know what I mean. Yeah, he's very touchy-feely, like touching her shoulders. And she kind of like puts a very subtle boundary up, but it's very subtle. She kind of subtle. accepts it a little bit um, because, like you said, it is the 2000s. Paula Henning wins a place in a summer course at the University of Heidelberg, where her grandfather had been a renowned professor. She has the second highest score in the country. We see her visit her grandpa in the hospital. He's like older than father time. She asks if he's in a lot of pain. And he says, I've been dead since Christmas. It's just that no one has noticed. That made me laugh. And, you know, but he tells her, you know, I'm so proud of you. You're going to do great. Good job. And then as she leaves, he's like, can you uh, do me a favor and pull the plug on the way out? And like laughs like it's the funniest thing anyone's ever said. And she's like, oh, grandpa. <laughs> um, she gets home to her dad and her mom. Her dad runs like a private practice. Also, w with an examination room with the most windows I've ever seen. I would feel so <laughs> awkward if I was in that I examination know. room. I thought it was a greenhouse at first. It looks and like it. Patients come in. I'm like, what? There's no way that I don't know <laughs> what they do at private practices, but I've never seen that. <laughs> you, how could you see anything? It's all natural lighting. <laughs> um. But Paula is kind of rude to her mom and dad. Um, she basically tells her dad that she doesn't want to end up in some third-rate clinic like the one he runs or pregnant and ruining her career like her mom. Just a total asshole. And we understand that the dad is not close with the grandpa, but we don't really know why. Paula just thinks it's because her dad's jealous or something because he's a loser. I don't know. It's like running a private practice is pretty good. Right, mm -hmm. I've. Oh, that's, I agree. It's very the the levels, I guess, of doctor respect are like. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I just was like, "There's no way that this man's a failure." <laughs> um, but her mom gives her a big hug and is like, "You're gonna do great at Heidelberg." We next see a man who wakes up on an operating table, groggy, and I do love this scene because this one is it's mm -hmm. good. It's like. I'm sure this is their idea, and then they were just wrote the movie around this scene. Yeah, because the way and the actor on this table is so good because he's like, you know, when you wake up and your mouth is really dry, he is just selling that so perfectly, and we just see like, just you know, light pouring down. Just the shot is of his face, and he's so confused, and he looks over and he sees that there's you know, surgeons working on him, and one says, "Oh, he's awake," and. Um, a doctor, he, he announces specimens awake. The man looks over at a table where intestines are deposited. So the doctors are just going to work and discussing new student Paula. Interesting. So this must be Heidelberg. And the man on the table sees that his abdomen is being held open by various clamps, like to like horror. But he, I don't, I can't tell if he can feel anything. He kind of acts like it later. Maybe it Maybe, but he's definitely like he can't move except for his neck, I guess. And then he sees that there's like a beautiful, like prosthetic. I don't even know how they made this, but it's it's his hand, and most of the skin has been cut away. And but I don't, it it looks like a little diagram. It's really cool, but obviously, That's if really that was cool. your hand, you'd be like mortified. And um. He shudders in horror as he looks up at the sign on the wall. Anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That's how they sold the movie. Yeah. And, like they shot that one scene. And that's it. And but I love the hand too, because he like he moves his fingers. <gasps> yes, like, yes. He oh, like just slightly moves. So I don't that just it's so horrific. It's so horrible. And that like that that scene, this movie might be not very good. Um, but that scene is ten out of ten. Like mm -hmm. that is the we're honestly worth the price of admission. Um, and there's some other good ones too, but I don't know. So on the train to Heidel from Munich to Heidelberg, Paula meets Gretchen, who is the hot woman I was talking about. She is blonde bombshell. She is very horny, like the horniest character in a film I've ever seen. Um, 
but she's beautiful. And I do think this actress does a great job. Gretchen has a lot more of a laid back attitude to their past professor's sexual harassment. She's just like, eh, well, I didn't have to take any uh, second rate courses. I, I'm sure that there are some, I have no doubt that there are women who try to ju- like in their brain, try not to go crazy by justifying things like that. Mm-hmm. But again, this just feels like what a man thinks would happen is a woman would be like, oh, whatever, you know, old man groped me who should just be providing my education. But that's just life. Like, I've never yeah. heard a single woman say that in my life. And no. most of the people I know are women. So I have heard them be, you know, harassed. And I have been harassed by like previous coworkers and uh bosses and stuff and i was never like well (laughs) that's just life no oh and i did write down because i do think that this movie in its own way kind of i don't think it's trying to but it kind of shows this interesting dichotomy of like what it's like to be a pretty woman and what it's like to be deemed an ugly woman and i found that very cool and interesting And just to give my insights as someone who I still get viewed as a woman a lot, but I'm definitely like, like when I say this, I do think I, I'm not saying I'm unattractive, but if you were just going by the terms of like how women are supposed to be attractive, I have like nixed all of my, like I don't have boobs. I now have facial hair. I've got short hair, you know, it's like, and so I gave like a pros and cons list of life now as that. (laughs) <laughs> Where I used to be a very young, attractive woman. Um, pros, no more cat calling. No male coworkers or bosses hitting on me. That's great. And no, just like, just basically like way, I have not really been harassed in public like I was. Mm-hmm. Cons, people are not as nice. I will say. Uh-huh. Like yeah. going to the store at first I thought there was something wrong with me because people used to be so nice. Like men and women would just be like complimenting or just being nicer. Whereas now I think I just get the treatment like any, you know, (laughs) like a non young pretty girl gets. And just people don't seem as interested in talking to me if they're not like trying to be my friend. Whereas before I I don't know. I guess I took it for granted. Now, again, I'm not saying that that was nice because sometimes that was followed by harassment, but I just do think that's interesting. So that's my view of pretty privilege is I do feel like people might be nicer to you, but the cons of being a woman, not that this doesn't happen to men, but far outweigh the pros. Yeah. And I mean, I can speak to this too, as an aging woman who used to get a lot of attention, especially like in my twenties when I was like severely underweight. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, I can co-sign all of that a hundred percent. And I heard a comedian, Michelle Wolf, who's not, you know, traditionally attractive. And she said, um, men take you or well, people take you more seriously if you're not pretty. I think that's and true. And I that like comforted me a lot because I I'm like really close friends with somebody who's considered very pretty and I hear about it like all day long. And so it's just um kind of nice to at least have something. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I will say I had a friend in high school who is like the like just everything you could check off. She was tall, naturally thin, blonde. She like at Aeropo- it's either Aeropostle or American Eagle. They don't have retail workers. They have models so that they can discriminate who works there. So only my tall, thin friends ever got offered a job there. So that's her. But she had like the least luck with men. Like she only mm-hmm. attracted assholes. And again, not that that isn't just true of m- a lot of women, but it just surprised. I was kind of taken aback at just how horrible the men were and they were the only men in her dating pool it seemed like um whereas i feel like i i don't know again i'm not trying to obviously like anybody can be rude and they can be rude to people not stereotypically attractive but it seemed like she had a higher proportion of assholes than probably yeah you know what i'm saying like i feel like yeah they didn't 
they didn't really value her either. They only like, okay, this is what I mean. It seemed like a lot of them only wanted to be with her because of the way that she looked. Whereas I always felt like anyone who was interested in me, that was part of it. But it was also like my personality that they were attracted to. And she had a great personality too, but it's like they didn't care. So yeah, I, I think that is something interesting about this movie, but I don't think they were trying to do that. Well, I think they were in a, in casting yeah. Franca Potenta and she's not, she's by no means ugly. Yeah. But next to Anna Luce, <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's definitely a contrast in terms of the, you know, the different flavors of beauty, I guess. Yeah, that's true. So on the train, there is a young man named David who collapses. And I immediately wrote down, she is going to operate on him later. Um, I know it said, I did not see the IMDb summary. It's just, it was obvious. Um, and it turns out he's got like, what is it? Like uh, an arrhythmia, right? Car- cardiomyopathy, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that's right. So she had to give him CPR, but now he's okay. But he has a really laid back view on it. He's just like, well, well you know, that's life. And um, I guess he can't really be cured of it. But, you know, they have a nice little moment, though Gretchen imme- like Gretchen hops on any man's bones. And so she flirts with him right in front of Paula and she's kind of put off because Gretchen is everything she's trying not to be. Like Paula is not having any fun. She's only studying and she wants to be a good and she sees Gretchen in a kind of derogatory way, I think. But yeah, David jokes that he's a textbook case, and if they are nice to him, they can have his corpse. J- Gretchen jokes that first they have to see that the rest of him is in good working order. Wink, wink. And David says that he's meeting someone tonight in a bar who thinks that they can help him. Now, why? Dude, why are you? What doctor would be like, well, meet me in a bar first? Mm-hmm. Stupid. <laughs> So Gretchen and Paula check in at the Heidelberg and they're led to their room by Phil, as in fill her up, which is, I guess, his nickname. I don't know. All the guys here are horrible. <laughs> they're really bad. Also, and I do want to say this. I don't think it's like labeled as a horror comedy, but it's. I think it's supposed to be funny. And, you know, like often, like I, I used to watch a lot more like Korean cinema and like, I don't get it. Like I don't get the humor. Yeah. Um. I mean, I get, I get it in like Bong Joon Ho movies, but like a straight comedy, I do not find funny. Mm. And this one was not funny. I never laughed once. Oh, same. at any of the jokes, it was just like, Ew, just like a real cringe. Yeah. Um. So they're eye roll moments for sure. Like for nothing sure. ever. I don't think anything made me laugh. I again, I was invested the whole time. Like my attention was grabbed. But uh, it was kind of in like a what what sick thing am I watching in front of me? I don't know. And also, again, like we mentioned earlier, the boom mic is just so fucking <laughs> distracting. I've never I'm sure there's been a moment of seeing a boom mic in a film before, but never this fucking much. I was like, Jesus mm-hmm. Christ, who did, was this this guy's first day on the job? Um, <laughs> I literally wrote down that damn mic is in so many shots. <laughs> So (laughs) Gretchen thinks that Phil's funny, but Paula doesn't get it um, because she's missed no fun. Um, But also it wasn't funny. Gretchen and Paula walk to their to the new anatomy lab with this. Yeah, kind of like a music video. The the music in this movie is great. (laughs) They meet Gabby along the way. And I just want to mention Gabby is like. Okay. Okay, I'm not trying, I'm not shallow. It's just, I think this movie is trying to say something with this. Gabby is, just looks like a normal human being that you'd see on. Like, she does not look like these movie (laughs) actresses. So it's like, Paula next to Gretchen, you think Gretchen's like, oh, wow, she's the pretty one. And then Gabby next to these (laughs) two is another layer, you know? Mm -hmm. I found that interesting um though gabby's very cute i like again i'm not saying this like this ugly bitch was in this shot but like <laughs> we all know what i mean right <laughs> she's wearing frumpy she's not, clothes she's too. not as cool yeah. yeah she's definitely not as cool as they are yeah she looks like somebody you would see in a library you know she's just a big nerd yeah which is what i want my doctor to be to be fair <laughs> <laughs> so 
Paula's impressed by the lab, which she calls spacey. It's actually giant and dark and creepy. Gabby mm-hmm. thinks she sees one of the bodies move, and Gretchen and Paula are kind of like, hmm, okay, I mean, you're just kind of scared. Gretchen pulls back the plastic sheet to see that the body has no head. And it is moving now. It keeps twitching. And we get this scene. I do like this. I, I feel like this shows us a lot about Paula's character is she is clearly freaking out about seeing this dead body move, but she kind of has this whole monologue she does out loud about like trying to find the logical explanation for something because science has an explanation. And that is how she views the world is like everything has a reason. And so she's like, you know, impulses, how that's what makes the body parts move there. It can be done. It can be manipulated. And she finds out that others, these male students have put this like electric stuff. And I don't know if this is really how it would work, but in doing this in the like electrical closet, they were just trying to prank the girls. And she's really pissed off. She's like, you have no respect for, you know, bodies, which is true. I mean, that is fucked up. When um, later they're at the bar and again, there's a shot of like a barmaid lady and like I, that felt intentional to me too i don't know um it, it, i don't it just it felt like there are a lot of women in this I, it's interesting because compare this to summer party massacre there are a lot of women who look like real women in this mm-hmm. movie but I, this is by no means a feminist movie just something oh, interesting no. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um So at the bar later, the students talk about who they studied under. There's one student, Casper, who says that he studied under his uncle, who was a butcher. He says, meat is meat, but uh, and like laughs for so long as the camera just pans around this table of like a bajillion students just looking at him like, damn, bro, he got the whole squad laughing like they're just not enjoying it. Um, This guy gives me a real Jason Dean vibe from Heathers. You know, he's kind of. Who's Jason D? JD, the the Oh Christian Slater. Like he's not as I just feel like that's the vibe. When people okay, side note, Gretchen refers to him as tall, dark, and handsome. And I guess when I was younger and I heard that, I never thought it would just be like an average looking white man that they mean. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you mean tall, dark, and handsome? He has dark hair. <laughs> do you know who Ricardo Montalban is? I don't think so. Okay, he was a he was a movie and a TV star when I was growing up, mm-hmm. and he's like, anyway, he's a Latinx guy, but he is tall, dark, and handsome, or he was, yeah, at the time, and yeah, that's what I always thought. I'm just, just like not like the most milk toast white <laughs> man you've ever seen in your <laughs> life, who happens to be a brunette. <laughs> and doesn't like Casper have like weird facial hair? He's got One a soul patch, does. and okay, yeah, yeah, he would look. One million times better if he shaved that shit off. (laughs) I literally wrote down, not the soul patch. (laughs) (laughs) So Gretchen then flirts with Hein, who, that's the blonde guy, right? That's the the guy. The himbo. Yeah, the himbo. And he does kind of have like a Ryan Gosling Ken look to him. I enjoyed him. I actually think this guy's very charismatic. I think he's. I liked him a lot. Yeah, he did a great job. We also find out that this is the titular bar that David was going to. He decides to go to the restroom and is attacked, subdued, and dragged off. The server sees this happen and is like, he just passed out from being drunk. Okay, well, who's the guy's dragging? Is that your bouncer? What are you saying? That guy's just drunk. Like, I feel like a better thing would be if she somehow noticed that he wasn't there anymore. Or notice a spot of blood, and but was just like, mm, whatever. But to be like, oh, he's just drunk. So now some cronies are taking him away? That makes no... Because also, we can see that the person's wearing scrubs and gloves. Right. Oh, that's just the crew of surgeons that are here that always take away the drunk. That must be what she's thinking. The bouncers at my bar who are all wearing scrubs. <laughs> Every Sunday, they grab a new guy. <laughs> Well, of course, as we all guessed it, David wakes up on the operating table. Who would have who would have thunk? And he's not totally paralyzed, so he grows to grab a knife from the table next to him. One of the doctors goes to inject him in the neck. He slices the doctor across the chest. But they end up killing David and stabbing him, and now they state they can't use him anymore. There is a great shot that because like David, he's naked, 
And then he just kind of falls once they've killed him. And the camera just kind of like pans out from this as the doctors and the scrubs are just like, "Mm, that sucks. And he's just naked on the ground. I just feel like, I don't know. That's always how I feel like at the doctor, just naked and humiliated. (laughs) And he's got a tramp stamp. Yeah, he does have a tramp stamp. Oh, my thing was, okay. And I don't know why they do this, but every time I've gotten surgery, they they make you take out all of your piercings. And I noticed that he still had his eyebrow piercings in. And I know this is mm. this is obviously not a, above board, but I'm like, that would have been a good detail is if they had taken his piercings out to be like, uh-huh. he's truly, well and truly like a specimen now. Because why would you keep them in? You took his clothes that's off. Good. I don't know. I just felt like that stood out to me. Mm. As somebody who has piercings, who has to take them out. That was weird. I was going to say also, I find scalpels to be one of the scariest things. Because a tiny yeah. cut to me is way scarier than a bigger cut. Ooh, ooh, creeps me out. <laughs> so the students um, the next day are taken to a display of plasticized bodies. And it is very beautiful. Like they are all in these different poses. There's all these different views. You and I went to see the bodies exhibit once. And yeah, it reminded me of that. It, Which I mean, it is amazing when you see it and you're just like, this is a body. Like if I was a surgeon, like they're acting like they're kids in a candy store. And I felt like that was, that was a good vibe. And we notice that one of the models is the guy with the hand, except we don't see yes. his face. Cause it's been totally like dissected mm-hmm. too, but we, you can recognize the hand and these models are just amazing. They did a great job. They look, oh, they look creepy, but good. Like high quality. So then we have a little montage of Paula working and studying. During one of her classes on anatomy, the body of David turns up on her dissection table, and she and Gretchen have to have a smoke in the bathroom because it's so distressing. I mean, that would be really scary. Paula's instructor, Professor Grombeck, humiliates her by daring her to dissect the heart, which, like, wouldn't that just be a huge thing that you'd never make somebody do? Like, the people, this movie... Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> like makes Germany seem like a hellhole <laughs> where uh, everyone's mean to you. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, given what we find out later, it makes sense for his character. But I think realistically, if you were in med school and you're like, oh my God, I know this guy. Yeah, they would um, never. They would never. Like that would be my first alarm bell is that my, that I'm not being taken seriously in this moment. Paula finds that David's body bears strange incisions and that he has an almost gummy or rubber-like blood. She decides to investigate the mysterious circumstances surrounding his death. Casper stops by to ask her out because they've been making eyes at each other. And again, I'm not even... He's an obvious red herring. Like, just when you see this guy, you're like, this guy, they wrote red herring on this guy's forehead and just put him in front Mm -hmm. of us. I know he's not the guy. Quit trying to make me think that he is. (laughs) You're not a good enough movie for that. (laughs) Um, And this test is not something that her professor wants her to do, but she's just, I don't really understand the medical part of it all, but she's just basically saying that there's no, there's no reason for his blood to be like this. And she finds, she feels an almost like she's guilty because he's died, even though she just saved him, even though, I mean, I'm like, girl, you can't save everyone. So she begins to, she proceeds to cut a sample for an independent test, and she's intrigued to find a triple A mark near David's ankle. But she's then startled by the school's mortuary assistant, who wants to know if Professor Grombeck is aware of her acts. After she leaves, he places a sign on the container where David's body is stored, marked crematorium. And we see also that he's got this like little red book because she asks where the body came from. And the guy's just like, just like doesn't tell her anything. And she she kind of has this moment where she's like, I want to know where this body came from and who his doctor was. And the guy just looks at her. And I got to say, that is how it feels being a woman. I feel like sometimes, you know, is you're very serious and you're just trying to stand up for yourself and just people just are like, well, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and unlike the killer in, and and this guy also isn't the killer, but I mean, unlike the killer in Slumber Party Massacre, this guy does look scary. Oh, yeah. Like if you ran into him on a sunny day, 
you know, <laughs> intimidating. He's like, well, yeah, yeah, very scary. Paula explains her worries to Casper, who kisses her to shut her up. I is my least favorite trope. I fucking hate that shit. It's not romantic. I'm just like, oh, okay, great. And then he tells her, you know, you're cute, but you smell like formaldehyde or something. Yeah. Wow, thanks. She just feels like shit. This poor woman. I feel really bad for her. So then we see that the med students are having a picnic, and Gretchen reveals that she got the first highest score. Oh, because... um. Gretchen and Paula are are just chilling, hanging out, and Paula explains, oh, she got in because she got the second best paper for this Coke contest. And she's like, well, how did you get in, Gretchen? And she's like, I had the best paper. And I do think that seems very cute and great. But it's just so like, oh, well, actually, the hot, sexy one who wants to fuck every man. Well, she's the smartest. I don't know. It just was like, of course. I don't know. Everything feels so choreographed in this movie. Um. <laughs> And then she explains that she's going out with Hein for his body. And I did love this scene. This scene made me love Gretchen is that she like just manhandles him, turns him around and just points out how muscular his back is, like points out the muscles. Then she's like the gluteus maximus and <laughs> takes his pants down, smacks his ass and then pushes him away like he's a piece of meat. And then she like asks Paula, like, do you know what Casper's dick looks like? Um, how big is it? Well, they all talk about how big our boobs are. We should talk openly about their penis size. Okay, Gretchen, go off, Queen. Um, well, and there was this, there was a thing that Casper said in the bar, and I didn't write it down. But when he was talking about how, like his his uncle Butcher was like you know an expert, and he knows which cuts of meat are the most mm -hmm. expensive. You know, I think that there are a couple of, you know nods back to that idea that like really all we're dealing with is meat mm. here at the end of the day and so her basically using him as a piece of meat i think is pretty great yeah and like her just using him as an example to show off because he's so muscular yeah. showing off and that that would be what she likes in him is just that she yeah. can see the muscles she does not care about him as a person Gretchen is great. And I literally, after that, I wrote down, please, I don't want Gretchen to die. I knew it was a foregone conclusion, but I was like, please, God, if you can hear me, do not kill Gretchen. She's my favorite character now. <laughs> God from 24 years ago. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll try, buddy. <laughs> Paula finds clues pointing to an ancient secret society, the anti-Hippocratic society. Ooh. Oh, how crazy. You know, the Hippocratic Oath, <laughs> we're anti that. Um, they performed gruesome experiments on living people who they deem undesirable. Okay, this is where I get on my soapbox. That's not a society. That just happened and does still happen. I found out that there are only a few states in America, North Carolina not being one of them, where it is illegal to give a pelvic exam to somebody with a vagina against their will like when they're knocked out like in north carolina your doctor oh and to have medical students do it i should say in north carolina if you are put under anesthesia they have the right to just let medical students perform a pelvic exam on you without your knowledge and that actually okay not to be TMI, but the procedure I recently had, I was going under. And this made me realize that I have a really good OBGYN because she asked me, she was like, I'm going to have two students with me. Are we, are you okay with them doing an exam on you? You'll be under, you don't have to be awake for it, you know? And I was like, sure, that's fine. And I met the students beforehand. They were two women. I mean, I really, I really trust my OBGYN, but I, I was shocked when I heard that. I was like, oh, she could have just done that without asking me. And I, I would have no legal, legal repercussion. So not only is that just history, medical history, it literally happens now and can happen to you. And it happens mostly, uh, to women of color and just people of color in general. And the his medical history is terrifying. So I don't know. This part just made me kind of roll my eyes a little bit because it's like, this isn't some mm. big secret thing. It it's just reality. And it is scary. But like, I don't to treat it like this horror thing, or I say horror thing as in, like, there's this big bad Mason 
you know, like society where this is happening. It's like, no, that's right. just normal, actually. It's abnormal to find someone who doesn't do that, apparently. So that's horrifying. Gretchen, like, does not give a shit about this anti-Hippocratic society. And Paula's friend, uh, Bernie, who she's talking on the phone with, um, she's the one who sent who she sent David's blood to. He says that David was injected with Promodol, which taxidermists used to use to plasticize organs. You have to give it to a live sub- subject and that the more that is injected, the slower the body moves until the person is turned into a statue. And that they, animal rights activists, at least in Germany, don't let anybody even use it on animals anymore. So he's like, well, how did this come into the bloodstream of your guy? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, Paula also comes across research about the rituals that they perform on transgressors of their rules or those who inquire too much. One night, Paula sits on her bed and realizes it has been soaked in blood with a candle underneath as a sign of warning from the society. And I will say, Paula has got to be one of the dumbest motherfuckers on this planet <laughs> because in like broad daylight at the very school she's in. Where she dissected, found this body of a guy with pla- with gummy blood is like, hey, guys, everyone, everyone, there's a secret society. I'm going to find out. Who do you think is doing it? You think that they all live underground? Like, o- obviously, it's the Heidelberg, you <laughs> dumb bitch. I don't know. This shit made me so mad. I was just like, why on earth would this not be in a hushed corner? That would be so much scarier of like, oh, they're everywhere. Even though we did our best to keep it a secret, they found out anyway. Well, no, they're, of course they're going to find out. You said it during class. You stupid, <laughs> stupid character. <laughs> <laughs> she looks up a reference in her books and traitors have to be sliced three times across the face. She then attacks a figure that enters her room, but it turns out to be her friend, Hein who is seeking consolation over his recent breakup from his girlfriend, Gretchen. And there's a great scene where he's just crying. And um, Paula's like, well, Gretchen's really beat up about it. She's also very sad. Jump cut to Gretchen and Phil, like getting kicked out of a restaurant because they're both being so crazy, sucking on oysters and just talking about (sighs) medical shit. (laughs) Gretchen does seem like the most fun person to hang out with. Like she gleefully takes the seat in the middle of this stuffy restaurant and just openly talks about the cadavers, you know, that they're dissecting and slurping oysters. (laughs) Um, So yeah, she's not broken up about it. And while they talk, Casper, Paula's you know, the guy she likes stops by and is upset she's not alone and storms off. And Heinz kind of like, well, should I go? And she's like, it's fine, whatever. Paula touches Heinz's chest, which displays a large scar. He jokes that he had a run in with a cadaver that she just brushes off, of course. Hein leaves, apparently more at peace. <laughs> As Gretchen and Phil prepare to have sex in one of the morgue halls... <sighs> <laughs> as which the least sexy place i could think of but actually yeah. again gretchen i wish we got more of her because she's revealing what a fucking freak she is like mm-hmm. she's just talking about um phil's body and kind of like turning him off and she's like yes. very she's like and he even says even strong guys can't handle you <laughs> like she's <laughs> just a lot um but as he's on top of her he gets killed and um hein it turns out it's hein and he injects gretchen with the promodol there's a great chase scene and that the physicality on gretchen is great because you can tell like her legs kind of numb as she's running and she just sells it really well and um gretchen's body becomes more and more stiff again radiating from the leg that he injected and she wakes up on a table Hein tells her that he will preserve her body. He's so absorbed in the work that he falls asleep without having disposed of Phil's body. And as the janitors come, he hides it in the morgue. And there's this whole scene where it's like he's he's stripped off his clothes so fast, stuffs him in, you know, one of the drawers. They the janitors can finally get in. He's hiding when they You know, there's some rigmarole. They finally open up the one Phil's in and he's headless. And then we see Hein has the head in a bag. Now, how in the hell did he get that with no blood, by the way? 
I, I guess now his gu- we didn't even see him inject Philip, so I don't know if he had the gummy stuff. I I was like, what? Like, I think I said what out loud because how did he do that with a scalpel? But he, <laughs> <laughs> but he puts the head in an Aldi bag. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so shout out to Aldi. Yeah, shout out to Aldi. I'm sure they loved that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Gabby notices that Phil is missing the next day and shouts out, anyone seen Phil? Hein butters. Not entirely. <laughs> okay, that was kind of <laughs> I love Hein. I think he's a great character. <laughs> when Paula tries to share her findings with the society about the society with Hein the next day, he menacingly tells her it's dangerous to know too much. Oh, because she also has stolen the little red book with all of the destinations. She steals it during class and um and when she sees she finds david and it just says like location or like origin aaa so it's not just a tattoo or something it's real so hein tells her it's dangerous to know too much and presents her with a present of gretchen's severed finger and then just swiftly takes the book from her and walks away paula goes to the police but they laugh at her they're like yo you know students we're thinking that, you know, a dead body. We we heard a student saying that a decapitated head was flapping his arms around, which I thought was a good detail. Um, Paula can't find Gretchen anywhere. She goes to the anatomy lab where Hein tells her she is on exam table three, or is it four? And then just starts stabbing some cadavers with the scalpel. And it's just like, it doesn't matter. None of this matters. And there's this weird slow chase scene with Heinz screaming after her that he was just joking. Paula ends up in some basement and a desk with medical equipment on it, and she sees the AAA crest above it. Grombeck sneaks up behind her and gives a speech about, do you think they could really get ahead in medical research if they adhered to ethical principles? Do you realize the last time Heidelberg won the Nobel Prize? And she also finds out that like Heidelberg is like connected with the nazis and stuff they were doing nazi experimentation which i i mean like yeah the nazi stuff true but yeah grombeck basically just gives the same rant i just gave about how all medical which i mean this is not all medical you know advances were done unethically but you know he gives a very i think actually what a lot of people do think you know and Just, you know, the problem with that is, you know, it, it's going to end up being the most unfortunate. The people treated the worst in society that this happens to because they're seen as disposable. And, you know, he says, like, everybody wants a cure, but nobody wants to, you know, be the one to take it. Yeah, no, obviously not. Like, nobody wants to be sterilized against their will, you know, or used as practice for people or just... I mean, they they weren't even always trying to advance medical science. They were just doing weird shit to people. Like, I don't know. Um, But it is very scary. Grombeck reveals that her grandfather was a member and that the drug he became famous for developing was the result of his experiment in Nazi concentration camps. She flees to the hospital to confront her grandfather. But when she gets there, I guess he just died. They're already changing the bedsheets. And I'm like, nobody... (laughs) <laughs> nobody told her i don't know the mom's like how did you know <laughs> uh, yeah um but there's a great scene where she's you know with uh her dad and um i i thought that was that was a genuinely good moment because now we understand why the dad was so against the grandpa it's because the dad's not mm-hmm. fucked up he didn't want to go this fucked up route and he's like you know you're very good at He's like, you have more skill than me and you are smarter than me, but you also have a heart, you know, so you're, you're great. And, you know, you're not like your grandfather, like you're not evil, like he is. At the assembly of the society, which I did love this scene, it's like Mm Hein is standing before all these old guys who tell him that he has broken the ethical rules because he has murdered somebody and that they were his fellow students. And I thought Hyde made a great point here. He's like, what re he <laughs> he basically gives the same speech that Grombeck gave um that Grombeck gave Paula to him again. He's like, why are you talking about ethics right now? You know, he's like, we're trying to advance 
things and I'm not bound by your bourgeoisie rules. And then he slashes himself three times in the face to, you know, be like, okay, here's your rich, your stupid ritual. I'm going to go back to do my shit now. Grombeck takes responsibility for the killings and leaves to call the authorities to arrest Hein. Now, fucking idiot Grombeck just announces his plan. To, like, Hein's in the room. Murderous psychopath Hein, um, who's just killed two people, and you're like, I'm going to send you to prison. Here I go to an empty room. Stupid asshole. <laughs> it's just like, you're not going to restrain him or anything. He's right there. Uh, <laughs> Later, Paula destroys the diplomas granted to her father. He even sees one literally given by the ant. Like, he's got it fucking hung up on the wall from the anti-Hippocratic Oath. It's not that secret of a society. (laughs) (laughs) He had it on the fucking wall. (laughs) I know, she's like searching, searching, searching. It's the one that's like damn in the middle of the wall. He's proudest of that one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um hein <laughs> fucking calls paul what can paula do he calls her to be like i think you're the only one who can help how about the fuck you're the leader of the society go to the police right now you s- oh my what can this student do um so paula goes by caspers and then they fuck um on his little twin bed it's well wait a second hein kills oh excuse Trump. yeah um, of course, it, it seemed. I mean, yeah, Hein kills yeah, Grombeck. There's we call we call. Yeah, it, he was not <laughs> long for this world. Um, also, I mean, it was pretty, but there's just inexplicably a bunch of oh, because he was okay. I was like, where are these butterflies from? He explained it earlier. He's got like a greenhouse or something, and but I, I, mm-hmm. I okay, it took me until just now to remember that. But I was like, <laughs> why are these butterflies here? <laughs> um. So yeah, Paula goes by Casper's. They have sex. Uh, um, literally, the caption said like "smooth pot plays" or something like that. <laughs> um, everything's cool until she finds Promodol in his medicine cabinet. Then she goes um, and just finds a stack full of papers about the the anti Hippocratic Society, and then knocks Casper out with a journal. Then she goes back to the anatomy lab in the dark alone and calls out for professor grombeck you didn't make any plans you just think he's gonna be here with all the lights off she's stalked by hein in the gallery of bodies and sees gretchen among the other displays and this is beautiful like Mm -hmm. she gretchen is in this pose of like like almost like a ballerina kind of pose and half of her of course we had to keep some boob i mean come on we're men of taste um, so she's got one boob and then the other half of her chest is all like pulled out and dissected. Hein comes up and he's just extolling the virtues of keeping somebody as beautiful as Gretchen young and preserved forever, which I did feel like was pretty good. Like that is the way gross men think. And I thought just this, this thing that, that they made was amazing. Cause he, he just like it's nothing like opens up a chest cavity on her and he's like look at her heart it's perfectly preserved and then pulls her face off it looked amazing anytime they have these statues it's like this should have just been the movie like why did you waste your time with all this stupid shit that's because you can't write and you can only do this cool stuff i guess um (laughs) so hein then knocks paula out so while Hein and his accomplice, who we don't really know who that is yet, are preparing Paula for preservation, luckily she still has all her clothes on, um, Casper then runs in and cuts her binds because he was what? The red herring. He tells her, remember I told you I'm not a doctor. I'm actually a historian who's been studying the anti-Hippocratic society. My name's actually Oliver. And that he is roommates with Ludwig, which, okay, at first in my head, I think from the corner of my eye, I saw him because at one point, like Paula's looking for Casper and we see him in the room and he's like obviously really high. And I think I just saw his hair and I wrote down Timothy Chalamet. But then when I got a good look at this guy, I was like, oh, he does not look like Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> like, no way. He looks not trying to be rude to this guy, but he looks like he could have been one of the boyfriends in the Slumber Party Massacre. <laughs> 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 
Um, so, so, uh, yeah, then uh, there is a great scene where Casper, now we know Oliver, he says, you know, I don't really know what to do. And she's like, well, quick, I need sodium chloride. Can you inject some into me? <laughs> like he, he gets all of it because the promodol's already been injected in her. She needs this or else she's going to die. And, you know, he's going to do it like subcutaneously. But then she's like, no, no, in the vein, like on TV. And there's this, just the actor's really great. He just goes for it. He's like, I can't do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> she's like, I'm going to die if you don't do it. So he injects her. It works. I mean, she's still a little bit like, you know, kind of moves a little bit weird, but like she's fine, which it seems like that worked startlingly fast. And, um, <laughs> and so then she's like, wait a second, but why did you have Promodol in your, in your cabinet if you're not a doctor? And it turns out it was Ludwig, not Timothy Chalamet. And so, now she's got uh then we see later that like Casper now he's all tied up he's he got stripped out naked which i thought was great like she never gets stripped naked but he got stripped down naked um and they even begin like cutting him um but Paula breaks loose just injects Ludwig a bunch with the promodol and runs away so there's a lot of cool shots of Paula hiding from Hein and there's a great scene. You know those bookshelves that like move with the crank? She traps him in the bookshelves. And I was so hoping that would be a kill. I thought that would have been yeah, a great too. kill. I was like, damn, this guy's still alive. Um, and she's been stabbed a bunch. Like she's she's, you know, bleeding from the legs. And um and in fact he finds her from the same little blood drips because she's she's like climbed up onto the bookshelves, but he can find her from the blood. So then there's a fight scene in the lab. And then Hein strikes a high voltage cable with a scalpel he's swinging at Paula and dies. Except he doesn't. He's somehow still alive. In his last gasp, he tries to stab Paula, but she turns the knife on him and stabs him, makes him stab himself. So then Casper and Paula escape together. Also, there's a great scene where Ludwig is he she took the <laughs> sodium chloride with her so he's looking for that so he can have an antidote but he can't find it so then he just grabs some water and some salt and pours it in there i'm like this is not gonna work and no. draws it up is about to inject himself it just kind of has a comical moment where he like almost breaks the fourth wall and looks at the camera and it's just like Ugh! and i guess he died <laughs> you know he's a little bit too late if that's how fast it can be how is she okay okay well whatever so Casper and Paula escape together. Now they're in the hospital and Paula fully owns her sexuality and says that she will heal Oliver. And now she's all cute and kissing him. Um, also, she calls him Casper again. And he's like, well, my name's my name's Oliver. <laughs> he then turned into my favorite character by the end because he's so like and pathetic she, and like kind of silly. Then she grabs his dick. Yeah. 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 That's that's this empowerment, I guess. She does now. You know. Oh, yeah. That's empowerment, I guess. <laughs> just, you know, men grab you, so you grab them. And That's that right. fixes it, I think. It's exactly the same. Yeah, it's exact. No, yeah. Um, <laughs> stupid. Oh, I didn't notice this because I just ended the film after. I was like, I'm done. <laughs> you were like, fuck this yeah, film. I'm out. <laughs> but apparently, halfway through the end credits, a sequence shows two of Paula's classmates, including Gabby praising Hein's abilities in dissection and preservation, discussing Grombeck's imminent replacement, and now in their respective practices, they will keep a low profile while exper experimenting for the anti-Hippocratic society. Oh, Gabby, we thought you were one of the good ones. Nope. Nope. Well, here's some trivia. The models used in the film were inspired by Dr. Gunther von Hagen's popular exhibition, Body Works, in which real cadavers are plasticized after being dissected. One character even mentions this process when we see the hall for the first time at the beginning of the film, but no real cadavers were used as the director thought it too macabre. I think that's fair. They looked great. Like, again, we've been Very to good. one of those bodies exhibits, and that's basically what it looks like. The models were created by a team headed by Joaquin Gruninger, and Berger Laub. The models were so accurate and detailed that the film's medical advisors thought they could be used as actual teaching specimens. That's amazing. I'm, again, they look... Y'all, if you're going to watch this movie for nothing else, watch it for that. Or look up some clips on YouTube. Uh, that might be better. 
<laughs> the song which can be heard when Gretchen and Phil have sex in the anatomy hall is called My Truth, sung by the actress Anna Luce, who plays Gretchen. Good for her. <laughs> well, what does Letterboxd have to say about it? Xander Kane gave it four and a half stars. Wow. Not sure how this one slipped past me, but what a damn good film. The tone is ever so perfect for this storyline. At times, it feels like a Jalo, and others, it feels like an American slasher film. Great performances and special effects, and acts as a perfect bridge between 90s horror and 2000s horror film. Definitely not talked about enough, and feels like it's almost been forgotten. Watch it. That's a, th- that's a take. Again, I, I'm, I'm torn, because I think the a lot of this is, like, there's clearly talented people in here. But you cannot tell me that this writing is good. Like, you can't look me in the face and say, we wrote a good screenplay, because you didn't. You wrote a bad one. And and what a shame, because you had great actors, and you had great props, and I don't even hate the storyline. I just hate what you did with it. Mm -hmm. Ronnie Gardaki gave it four stars. Franca Patente uncovers a secret society within medical school, includes displaced Nazi guilt, and multiple boom mics dropping into frame. This is pretty good. (laughs) The plot keeps you on your toes, and Patente is a lovely screen presence as always. I will push back on that. Never did it keep me on my toes. At all times, I knew exactly what was going to happen next. Camatrejo gave it four stars. (laughs) A-A-Amazing. Violet gave it one and a half stars. Paula kind of looks like Molly Ringwald. Okay, she does, but why is that the only thing? Like, that makes me feel like that's you saying, like, and that's why I hate this film. <laughs> Fuck Molly Ringwald. <laughs> we See Toe gave it one star. A very basic film. The scenery in Heidelberg or wherever they filmed was beautiful, and so was Franca Patente. The film, on the other hand, was a shit mashup of The Skulls, Scream, Flatliners, and Hostel. Too bad this film wasn't anywhere near as decent as the aforementioned movies. I don't like Hostel. I'm going to say it. It felt like Hostel, which is also a bad movie. Don't at me. Kelly Madden gave it one star. Daily Horror Hunt number 57, prompt number 28. Watch a horror movie that shares a language with prompt number 27. Yella from 2007. This shit is completely ridiculous. This plot is so outlandish that it's laughable, but the movie still isn't funny. It's so bad that it's almost uncomfortable to watch. I feel embarrassed for everyone involved. I agree. I even wrote down, this is hard to watch. Like, I don't enjoy watching this movie. (laughs) Okay, again, and I don't know, maybe like my endorphins are like elevated or something because of the sunshine. Um, I'm not sure, but I really did not enjoy this the first time. And I thought, well, give it to Mac. (laughs) Because Mac loves to tear shit apart. And then I watched it today and I was like, I actually kind of like this. And then you were like, can I please? (laughs) (laughs) So that's, I mean, I, I like it more than, than you do for sure. Um, But um, we get to the questions. I'll never watch it again. (laughs) I, I think I, well, what phobia is that? Well, we don't know. Um, I, we don't know. Um, <laughs> don't ask. I won't tell you. It's got to be. Okay. Hold. Give me a second. I could probably find a phobia for us. Like, um, like a medical. Like dead, dead bodies. Ooh. I, yeah, I don't want to see one. I've never dead seen bodies one. bodies phobia. Necrophobia. The irrational fear of dead organisms, for example, corpses. They really, they really, even like a dead bug, honestly, unless it's something as small as an ant, it just freaks me out. I don't know. It, I'm not saying that's like quirky or unique, but like, I just have a memory of when I was a kid, my first hamster, um, I did not realize they died so easily. And I went to go just play with him for the day, put my hand under him. He felt stiff, so I jerked my hand back, and the just the dead way he flopped back, it just, like I screamed. I was so freaked out, and I'm not saying it was just from that, but like that just illustrates everything I find so scary about a dead body. It's just like it's not right. Yeah. It's wrong. It just shouldn't yeah, be like wrong. that. Well, I don't know if it's wrong, but I don't want to be near anything dead if I can help it. I 
I can't remember where I was. I was in some place and there was a dead bird. And oh. it was like, a, I don't, I don't even know. I, so unspecific, but like, it was a place a dead bird shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if it fell out of a like, bag in the fridge. A, no, <laughs> it was like in nature, but it was just like, I don't, yeah. anyway, I just recently saw a dead bird. It was horrible. Um, and yeah, I just never want to see anything dead. No. Ever. Really bugs me. <laughs> what have we learned? Oh, so, excuse me. Rating. Let's rate it in scalpels. I'll give it a... I, I, I think that the acting, the physicality, and the effects, and the scenery are good enough that I'll give it three scalpels. But yeah. giant two taken. It's like only by the grace of those things is this movie watchable and enjoyable. Yeah, I w- I would say three too. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, don't, I mean, it's fine. It's fine. But, um, yeah. I mean, I liked I liked Gretchen's character. Oh, I love her. I like the. I like. The fact that she's just like, I, I wish she would have lived. I think right. it would have been like so much better if she would have lived. And stupid Franca would have gone. She's she's gotten killed off instead. like the you know like you always get the Madonna and the whore in slashers, and she is killed off kind of carelessly like that. Even though I feel like mm-hmm. her character at that point had been built up enough to where she didn't deserve that, you know. To be slain yeah, she sure. in such a way. I, I mean, I mean the 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 chase scene is really really amazing. Like, I would be, I would like to know was she a dancer? Like, I don't know this person at all. But the physicality of that scene was really great. And obviously, she's a good singer and sexy. But her character is very sexy, and her character, um, she's the smartest one. So I just don't get why. You know, and she's killed because she was so beautiful. It's like, uh, yeah, I just wish it would have been. And or if that could have been made something of, you know, because he's he's she's kind of like, oh, by the way, she's a genius. Right. You know? it, it's almost there to just be like, I, I don't know. It felt so like, of course she is, you know, um, not that you're going to mm-hmm. show anything about her character. We're just going to understand that she got the best paper. Um I don't know. Yeah, and she says that she dumbs herself down because the guys wouldn't give her the time of day. And really, she just wants to fuck guys. So that's like her – that's what she likes to do. But I wish they would have she- let – because I like that, but it gets so much more interesting when it gets into her being kind of like a freak, like being into their mm-hmm. bodies in a very clinical way. Yeah. yeah. And I wish they would have even given us more of that because she was so great. And I do feel like the reactions from the guys of being – they felt uncomfortable, you know, and it's like, yes. yeah, exactly. You know, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? And she had so much power over them that then it's so unfortunate to see her be so – it's what I said when I was referring to Slumber Party Massacre. This is the feeling I don't like, you know, of when you see yeah. Yeah. she's so humiliated in movies. Like women are so humiliated a lot of times in these movies. And I was just like, Gretchen didn't deserve that. She deserved better. Uh, well, what have we learned? Um, I'm not trusting. Uh, honestly, shop around for doctors. If <laughs> if your doctor feels like a creep, they are one, and find a better one. <laughs> you deserve yeah. it. If it's your health, we're talking about here. Would we watch it again? Probably not. No. Yeah. Favorite scene and or death? We've talked about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, all the ones I mentioned that were good; those are my favorites. Everything else, dog shit. Um. Who wins the You Fool Award? Fucking Paula for going Paula. into the classroom and saying, guys, crazy. I heard about this secret society. They're killing people. I'm going to find out who did it. <laughs> okay, dummy. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mac, for having this conversation today about these two films. Thank you for having me. Sorry for taking up so much time talking about this movie. Um it was enjoyable. No, not at all. I really wanted to hear your <laughs> takes on it, and you did not disappoint. <laughs> I'm glad. 
Thank you for joining us for this episode and for all your support. It means the world of horror to us, truly. Next time, we're going to be looking at movies with magical realism, with men from the U.S. and Pan's Labyrinth from Spain. If you're enjoying the podcast, please tell all your friends all about us. Remember, Wohos, we love you and don't go into the basement. Yay, we did it!